So hey everyone, my name is Sugi. I'll be doing a small talk on spicy persistence. So more about myself, like I said, I'm Ugi. I basically, I spent five years in the military. After that, I just self-studied for a year. I've done a bunch of certificates from OCP, ECPT, and I'm currently doing more. So I'm currently working on certified red team operator. Um, I work as cybersecurity analyst at Ardona Group, and one of my responsibilities include a purple teaming. Uh, so purple teaming is basically when you simulate and red team engagement, and you basically train your blue team to become better at dealing with day-to-day -day activities that they might see. So what did I do? So of course, I Googled what is persistence. So some of the options you're seeing here is Google giving us some ideas. What is persistence? So the act of persistence, not really what we're talking about here. The state or quality of being persistent, slowly getting there, still not it. Continuance of an effect after the cause is removed. Still not there. And the final one is attack mitre. So it's basically saying persistence consists, persistence consists of techniques that adversaries use to keep access to systems across restarts, changes, and uh, credentials and other interruptions they might encounter. So you're basically trying to maintain access to a system. So if you fish someone, you're trying to maintain your access on the machine itself. And even if they reset or they like log in to someone else and they come back, you still have your access, making sure you can do whatever you need to do. So before I begin, I need to give credit where it's due. Uh, I want to give credit to credit uh, to Chris for cyberbullying me into doing this. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I want to give credit to Rastamos and his certified red team operators course, which quite a few techniques that I'm covering today, I will be mentioning because of the course itself. And finally, Pentaslabs. Nearly every single technique that I'm discussing today, you will see on the Pentaslabs. So if you are curious and you want to learn more, that's so. Initially, I'm going to start off with very basic, very well-known techniques that pretty much nearly everyone who does penetration testing should know or have some kind of idea what it is. So here, we're talking about schedule tasks. Schedule task is as simple as it sounds. You're scheduling a task and you're saying, hey, at a specific time interval, perform a specific activity. So in this one, we have a, basically a cobble strike, and I'm telling the beacon to do this command. I'm calling the command updater, and I'm saying, hey, every hour, do this command. Uh, of course, you can't, you can't see what it is, it's encoded, but the command is basically saying, hey, after every hour, connect to this IP address on this specific port, which will be your attack attacker's machine. Very well-known vector, it's very easy to find, you know, it shouldn't be really used, it's quite common. Registry order runs, once again, you're basically saying, hey, when this specific user logs in, do this specific activity. So all we did, as you can see, we uploaded the payload, or beacon HTTP executable, and we moved it and we called it updater.executable. Very legitimate, very authentic, right? And we're using Sharp Persist, which is basically one of the tools you can use to do persistence. And we're basically saying, hey, when this specific user runs and logs in, you're going to run this registry key. And once again, we're going to get a reverse connection. Startup folders. So every user, when you connect, you might have wallpapers, you might have different files that you're using. And what you're basically saying with startups is, when, you, when this user logs in, and let's say you have a specific background, you're basically saying, hey, run this command as well, and we're calling it user environment setup. Very, very real, you know, completely not suspicious at all. And in this case, we have the user called Broomsec. And when the user logs in, we're going to gain access back because this will basically connect back to us. Once again, guys, very simple techniques. Now we're slowly going to pick it up. So RID hijacking. Originally found by this beautiful person, Sebastian Castro. And what he found is a way for a guest account to hijack a valid account credential. So basically, you're stealing the RID number of an admin and impersonating him. Now, to do this, you actually need to have system privileges on the machine itself. So you need, need to have quite a high access before you can even begin. If we look at SAM, so the registry SAM itself, if you have uh, system privileges and you go on the SAM, you basically don't see these specific hex values as you can see. So OX1F5, which is translated to RID501. And then you have the other value, which is 500, which is the administrator's account. We can validate which users exist on a specific machine with this one liner. So what do you have here? So we're currently in the register, uh, registry and we're looking at the values. This line specifically, if you look, we're basically looking what kind of number it is. And what Castro managed to find is that if we change this value 
this 501 and we change it to 401, we basically managed to impersonate and hijack the account of administrator. And we're basically giving admi uh, administrator uh, power to a guest user. As you can see here, if we do everything successfully, this line here will say 1402. And someone actually even managed to make a PowerShell script that you can use and automate the whole process. So what do we need? All we need is system privileges. And you can basically impersonate your admin and you pretend give your guest account administrators, administrators privileges. Now, this is a mouthful one. So image file execution <laughs> options injection. So what we're basically saying, here's an application and we're going to enable debugging on this application. And now when we are saying we can debug the application, we can in inject a command injection and basically say, hey, when this is allowed, you're going to do a specific action. So for this, we need three things. We need a payload and we need a specific action. The action itself that we're using today is going to be the not notepad being closed. Third, we're going to have three register key values as seen above here. So some of these values. So the first value is actually to enable the global flag in the registry. So what this will enable you to silently monitor a process being, mon being monitor monitored. So in our case, we're going to be looking for notepad being closed. That's the action we've chosen. Doesn't have to be notepad, can be any other application, but you're basically saying, hey, if this application closes, you know, warn me, like do some kind of an action. The below one, the reporting mode is basically, you're saying that, hey, you're enabling Windows Aurora reporting, which is basically going to start a pattern process and say, hey, it deals with what kind of issues an application can have, what kind of issues Windows can have, and it will launch an investigation and diagnosis of what, how can you can fix it. Here, basically all we do is we set up our listener and we launch it. And what happens is, so this specific executable where fault gets launched, right? And what actually does it tracks the errors. But we basically spawn our malicious payload as a child process on the process itself. So this application is running for issues, but we're actually attached to it. So even though it's looking for issues that one we're causing, so even though we're the ones causing issues, it's trying to find us, but that's not going to happen, basically. Office application startups. Now, Office in itself is very widely covered. There's quite a lot of extensive research done on homepage rules and forms. So I decided to talk about add-ins. So add-ins is a small feature of uh, Microsoft Word and basically it extends the functionality of the application itself. And you basically, you can use other people's modules, their scripts, their templates or whatnot. And what happens is when you launch Office, it will basically go to a designated area. We can basically find that area here with a single command and it will check if there's any load-ins that you can do, if there's any add-ins that you can start. So what can we do? All we simply do is we, once again, we have our malicious payload and we're thinking of, okay, what if we just move the add-in into the folder itself and then say, hey, when Office gets started, our malicious payload will start. Sadly, not how it works because Word is just gonna crash. It's not very stable because you're crashing the process itself. So you're saying when Word launches, you wanted to launch this one and it will crash the Word in exchange. Now, what can we do? How can we fix this? There's this magical thing called process attach. And what we're saying is there's, hey, when the word process gets launched, all we're gonna do is we're gonna launch a site uh, DLL. And that DLL will point to our malicious file, which will be our executable file, and we'll gain connection back. The word file will work and we'll gain our callback back. Now, finally, the spiciest of it all, and the final technique I would like to discuss is com hijacking. So COM in itself, component object model, has been with us from Windows 3.11 for years. Very old feature, very out of date, and it's quite complicated. Not that many people actually know about it. I've, I, haven't, I had no knowledge about this two months ago or so. And the easiest way to explain it is this. So here I have a screenshot, and the screenshot is basically me clicking a file on my desktop, right? And I have 7-zip installed. Now, since I have 7-zip installed, what happens is when I right click, a 7-zip option appears. So a function, I, I'm, I'm basically able to do the functions that 7-zip can do. You can zip files, you can extract it. Now imagine this. What if instead of when you're trying to zip a file, you're actually launching a malicious file? So what if I link my malicious payload to 7-zip and says, hey, if someone, does, if someone zips a file, 
instead of zipping the file, you're going to actually send the connection back to me. That is actually possible to do. So why is this technique so good? You don't need admin privileges. So we're not dealing in the current, uh, we're basically dealing with the current user registry. We're not dealing with the local machine. We don't need admin privileges. And this technique itself, COM and DCOM is not very well known. Not many people will have knowledge of this. It's a brilliant way for persistence, lateral movement, you name it. It's just a very, very good thing to know if you're doing pen testing and red teaming. So first, I'm going to show you how to do it manually. So all, we can, all we're going to use is Procmon, and we're going to find the class identifier, and we're going to look for parameters. Now, as I mentioned before, we can use 7-zip as a functionality. We can take a functionality from 7-zip and say, hey, instead of doing this action, you're going to do perform the action I'm telling you to do. That's kind of risky because if someone is trying to zip a file and nothing happens, they might suspect something is wrong. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look for registry keys which don't have any names. They're expired, maybe they're uninstalled, and they're empty. And we're going to attach our malicious file into it. So what we're going to need? We're going to set up the operation is reg open key. This is basically Procmon. Uh, we're going to set up the results to be name not found. Path ends with improve server 32 and exclude if path contains local machine itself because we're basically focusing on local user. Next, instead of doing it manually, I'm going to discuss a specific way it has been recorded. So there was a specific rat found called Compi uh, Fun and GData Security Labs researched it. And what they found was this specific um, rat was basically using Windows uh, Internet Explorer to maintain persistence. And what it was basically saying, hey, every time Explorer gets launched, you're going to connect back to us and we're going to gain access to it. Really difficult to find. Majority of tools are not configured correctly to actually catch this. But the way they exploited it was this. You have few specific locations that Internet Explorer will launch its stuff. And 3G student even made a PowerShell script. And what it will do is, it will automatically attach itself to this uh, DLL. Now, when we launch the script itself, the sample will just pop the calculator itself. So every time you open the Windows Explorer, you're going to launch a calculator. That's just the practical one. Yeah, it's very simple. You know, it's not malicious. We can step it up a bit. Instead, we can upload a malicious file, call it the same, and we basically say, hey, use this version instead of the original one. And now what will happen is, we will add manually a uh, location. So we basically hey, say, hey, when you open Internet Explorer, you're going to go to this location instead, which is our payload. And every time someone opens uh, Explorer, our payload is going to get activated. The best part about this, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant, when, once we spawn a payload, the payload itself will be iExplorer, and it's going to be under Microsoft Corporation. So it's going to be a trusted uh, it's going to be a, a trusted file. And it's basically saying, hey, yeah, we approve this, even though it's your malicious file and you're gaining access. That concludes my presentation, guys.